So the founding fathers have been used to justify everything from military invasions to God on the money to Jefferson playing Rambo. Maybe you've heard this urban legend too. Thomas Jefferson with the war paint on and the headband on, single-handedly taking on the Barbary pirates. Only, of course, after flipping off the Congress when it came time to ask their permission. Now, we can ask the founders what their vision for their young republic was. I think the answer would shock most people, certainly shock your establishment Republicans. And it would most certainly shock anyone that holds a position of authority at the Obama OMSNBC News Network. The reason they don't want to, that, that, that it would shock people was because they don't want to know the answer to this because it's very inconvenient. It would totally upset their apple cart if we turn it upside down. Maybe we should give it a go. Shall we? Yeah. Start with this. Confucius said that the superior man thinks always of virtue. The common man thinks of comfort. Now why is my church starting with Confucius, eh? We're going to have an ancient Chinese proverb session here. We're going to meditate, do S training. We need to talk about things other than politics is why I bring Confucius into this. We've been talking about politics since the Federal Reserve was established in 1913 and it hasn't stopped it. We've been talking about politics since Barry Goldwater was nominated in 1962 and it hasn't, 64, and it hasn't stopped it. It just keeps getting worse. Maybe there's something else that we're missing and we should be talking about. Maybe that's character. Maybe it's virtue in our public affairs, virtue in ourselves. Let's talk a little bit about, a bit about Thomas Jefferson and that issue. Some interesting things you probably don't know about Thomas Jefferson. In his first inaugural address as president, which was written, not delivered, written as it should be, Jefferson said that he knew that there were states that wanted to go their own way and he blessed them. He said, if new confederations form or federations form, we should wish those people amity and we should want to trade with them. We all have common ancestors, but we should wish them peace and the best. Jefferson knew that after the purchase of the Louisiana Territory, which by the way, get my latest docudramedy, what Lincoln killed for the constitutional explanation of it, it was legal, it was constitutional, but Jefferson actually thought that west of the Mississippi River there would be new states that would form and they would not join their little union and he was perfectly comfortable with it. His exact phrase was, why should a citizen, a, a citizen on the east side of the Mississippi River hold a grudge against a citizen that decides to move to the other bank and start his own state? What's the big deal? Jefferson also in 1803 knew that Northerners, including a former Secretary of State by the name of Timothy Pickery, were plotting secession. Northerners, Yankees, damn Yankees. By 1822, with the passage of the Missouri Compromise, as they called it, Jefferson also said that at that time, since the geographical border had been established, that he heard the knell of the Union. This did not trouble him as much as other things that he saw happening. I'd like to take you to a letter that Jefferson wrote to John Taylor of Caroline, my favorite founder, and the greatest little R Republican American that ever lived. Jefferson was inspired. Have you ever thought, who inspired Jefferson? You know, we all have heroes, Ron Paul, Tom Woods. We all have heroes in this, in this movement. Jefferson had a hero, his muse, was John Taylor of Caroline. There's a reason why Mr. Taylor has been vanquished from history books. He's another one of those inconveniences modern day conservatives don't want to talk about. We'll get into that in a moment. <clears throat> Jefferson wrote a letter to Taylor on the 28th of May, 1816. He congratulated Taylor on the publication of a book, which was basically a review of a book John Adams had written 24 years prior called A Defense of the Constitutions of the United States. Adams, as you may know, was not a little government guy. He was really good in the convention of 76. He was good as a minister to France. He was a rotten president. And he was not a federalist, as his title implied. He was a monarchist. Taylor set about the task of 
basically proving that Adams was a monarchist and that he and his buddy Hamilton were dangerous. It took him 24 years to complete this book. Jefferson gets a copy of the book and writes to Taylor this, quote, you have successfully and completely pulverized Mr. Adams' system of orders and his opening of the mantle of republicanism to every government of laws, whether consistent or not with natural right. Indeed, it must be acknowledged that the term republic is a very vague application in every language. Witness the self-styled republics, Holland, Switzerland, Genoa, Venice, Poland, were I to assign to this term a precise and definite idea, I would say purely and simply, it means a government by its citizens in mass, acting directly and personally, well, we could use a dose of that, couldn't we? According to the rules established by the majority, and that every other government is more or less Republican in proportion as it has in its composition more or less of this ingredient of the direct action of the citizen. That's why you're here, direct action. Mises wrote a book called Human Action. Read it. It's very important. Such a government is evidently restrained with very narrow limits of space and population. I doubt if it would be practicable beyond the extent of a New England township. He's talking about government not being effective beyond a population of, say, 5,000 people. Now, explain to me, then, how it's going to work for 309 million. The fact of the matter is, is it doesn't work, and it can't. And the reason it can't is because it's out of scale. And Jefferson started to see this early on. Jefferson continues in his letter to Taylor and explains his thoughts on what he thought was the most important feature of the American version of government. You remember, remember, these men really were revolutionaries. They established things in this, on this continent and in this hemisphere that had never been done in the history of, of, in all of human recorded history, like the First Amendment. The First Amendment wasn't just an amendment. The First Amendment was a termination of a thousands year old political order where the religious was always mixed with government. And it led to, 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 sometimes there were good times, other times there were absolute disasters, deadly disasters. And when the founders committed to the First Amendment, or when Madison and Jefferson did, they changed the world, they really did. It was the first time in the history of man, history of man, that religion had been separated from government. Think about that, that's an American achievement that we still honor today unless you're a Republican cheering for Mitt Romney to save the pledge with God in it. Jefferson continued with his letter to, to Taylor. The purest Republican feature in the government of our own state, he's talking about Virginia, where we currently are, is the House, Virginia? Yeah, Virginia? 